Hey everyone, I'm Monkey of Chaos, and this is a cheap game review. Every week we look at a new release on Steam, costing $5 or less. Today we're looking at Dagon by HP Lovecraft. It came out September 24th, free to play. Uh, from the Steam store, face unspeakable horrors, succumb to madness. Welcome to a free demonic narrative experience inspired by HP Lovecraft. So, wanted to do something a little scary for Halloween. There wasn't really much choice for scary stuff this week, um, so this seems like the best bet. Uh, so let's check it out. Dagon is a faithful interactive adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft work focused on story and atmosphere. You will not find difficult choices, action sequences, or inventory management here, and movement is limited to progressing through locations along with the plot. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Uh, during the game you will encounter interactive elements. Some of them will allow you to continue your journey, others reveal interesting facts about the original short story, its historical background, and the author. Some of the trivia is hidden in order to find these secrets. Focus your eyes and look for the Elder Sign. Uh, you can also access all found facts later. They will be available in the main menu. Got it. Lovecraft's Letters. As to letters, my case is peculiar. I write such things exactly as easily and as rapidly as I would utter the same topics in conversation. Indeed, Pist epistolary expression is with me largely replacing conversation as my condition of nervous prostra yeah. prostration becomes more and more acute. I cannot bear to talk much now, and I'm becoming a silent to the spectator himself. My loquacity extends itself on paper. H.P. Lovecraft to Reinhardt Feiner, December 23rd, 1917. Throughout his life, Lovecraft penned around 100,000 letters to his friends and fans, out of which about 10% survived to this day, but his tendency to endless correspondence was a relatively late growth. In youth, I scarcely did any letter writing, thinking anybody for a present was so much of an ordeal that I would rather have written a 250-line pastoral or a 20-page treatise on the rings of Saturn. Lovecraft would often skip meals to afford postage. Collections of his correspondence have been published in various books and selected letters can be found online. Some readers consider them his most important legacy. Right. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. Morphine entered into use in the 19th century and was routinely administered to treat severe pain during the American Civil War and World War I. It was also sold without restrictions until 1914. Morphine became more popular after the invention of the hypodermic syringe around 1854. Frederick Surdener, who first isolated the substance, originally named it Morphium after Morpheus, the Greek god associated with dreams. At the time when Dagon was published, morphine abuse, known as soldier's disease, already posed a big problem in the United States. Pacific, that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German Sea Raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation so that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. The Huns. The Huns were Central Asian nomads who established a dominion in Europe and invaded the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. They were known as brutal, deadly warriors and masters of quick raids who also developed powerful composite bows, lassos, and early siege weapons. During World War I, the British used the word Hun as a synonym for Germans in order to emphasize their brutality. However, the term originated when the German Emperor Wilhelm II gave a speech to his troops on the 27th of July 1900 before they embarked to China. Should you encounter the enemy, he will be defeated. No quarter will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into your hands is forfeited. 
Just as a thousand years ago, the Huns under their king Attila made a name for themselves, one that even today makes them seem mighty in history and legend. May the name German be affirmed by you in such a way in China that no Chinese will ever again dare to look cross-eyed at a German. The refusal to take prisoners was a clear breach of the laws and a customs and customs of war adopted during the first Hague Convention of 1899. So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Pretty game, I'll give it Never that. Never a competent navigator. I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. Anything else? But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream infested, was continuous. Ooh. Huh? This is fine, everything's fine. I don't see anything else to look at. When at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. For there was in the air, and in the rotting soil, a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing, and nothing in sight, save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. Nothing else to look at. Squish. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I might. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. 
That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. these things? Nope. Yeah, looks like still nothing else. That night, I encamped, and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. Horrors of the Ocean, the creator of the Cthulhu mythos and the fictional underwater city of Relay was convinced that life could not exist at the bottom of the ocean because the water pressure would make it uninhabitable. Uninhabitable. Un un Today we note that the darkest depths of the ocean are home to many peculiar organisms. The deepest dwelling fish we have discovered so far, the Mariana snailfish, can live about 8,000 meters, more than 26,000 feet, below the ocean's surface in never-ending darkness and at hellishly crushing pressures, hundreds of times stronger than those found at sea level. Upon glancing at the modern photos of deep-sea creatures, such as the anglerfish and the fangtooth of the viperfish and their truly Lovecraftian characteristics, it's hard not to find some irony in this. fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance, an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. Um, yeah, I want to go up there. Oh, okay. yeah. Pick up the pack first. I have Got said it. that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plane was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost, and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of only a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze. I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps 
where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me. An object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself. But I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. For despite its enormous magnitude, and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith, whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. Else. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Storytelling methods. Dagon contained many themes and storytelling methods that Lovecraft developed in his later works, such as telling the story through carvings of the Mountains of Madness, the Nameless City, journals and characters' notes, the Shadow Out of Time, the Haunt Haunter of the Dark, islands emerging from the ocean, Call of Cthulhu, or fictional beings and deities based on real events and mythologies. Migo in the Whisperer in the Darkness. It's also considered the origin of the popular Cthulhu mythos. Some of the Lovecraft's other stories also conclude in a manner similar to Dagon, but let's give the details in order not to spoil the ending. Plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size were an array of bas-reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a Doré. I think that these things were supposed to depict men at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer, they were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background. For one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, 
I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then, suddenly, I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. It darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the marlin, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. And we drop. I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. Lose that. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm sometime after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard bells of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moments. Out of the shadows, mm. I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Journalist. Lovecraft, Lovecraft was a prominent figure in the world of amateur journalism. In 1915, he started publishing his own journal called The Conservative, which included political and social commentary, poetry, short stories, and literary criticism written by him and other authors. Howard was a skilled wordsmith, but he also took criticisms to heart, which resulted in his decision to step away from writing poetry and concentrate on weird fiction again for the first time since his teenage years. Dagon, published in 1917, is one of the short stories written during that period. This example excerpt from the conservative, conservative, the master of horror fiction, explains his attitude towards warfare and the idea of world peace. Why any sane human being can believe in the possibility of universal peace is more than the conservative can fathom. Should the entire civilized world agree simultaneously to disarm, one or more nations would un undoubtedly retain secret armaments and at the proper time take advantage of their more altruistic and less astute contemporaries in a wild career of conquest against unarmed victims. No country is or ever can be above warfare until the basic impulses of the human animal shall have miraculously changed. Yep, yeah, sounds about right. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. Dagon. Dagon was the main deity of the Philistines, worshipped through the Middle East as the ancient god of fertility and crops. In Hebrew, the word Dagon was a common noun for grain. The rulers of Akkad, Mesopotamia, chose him as the patron saint of their war conquests. He also appeared as judge of the dead in an Assyrian poem and an underworld prison water in one of the Babylonian texts. He is often mistakenly taken for a fish god due to the wrong interpretation of his name, as in Hebrew the word dag means fish. In H.P. Lovecraft's work, Dagon is an underwater deity ruling over the Deep Ones, a humanoid race with fish traits that reside in the oceans. He is worshipped by a secret cult called the Esoteric Order of Dagon. Uh, where am I looking? There we go. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. I've got the Necronomicon. August Derelith and the Cthulhu Mythos. August Derelith was an American writer and anthologist. He also befriended Lovecraft and published many of his works through his company, Arkham House. Although he greatly contributed to the popularization of the author's works after his death, he is surrounded by numerous controversies. One of his most questionable decisions involved introducing the good versus evil doctrine, Derelith was a devout Catholic, to the Cthulhu Mythos, which contrasted with Lovecraft's view of the world and his approach to cosmic horror. 
As a result, the author's works are often misunderstood and misrepresented in today's culture. It is also worth noting that Lovecraft was never really interested in creating a mythology, and the term Cthulhu Mythos was coined by Derelict after the author left the mortal plane. The Marketer Lovecraft's attempts to find a job in 1925 were influenced by advice he received from friends, among others. He started freelancing for a marketing magazine, where he would write announcements and commercials. Feel free to judge his copywriting skills for yourself. From an ad for Curtis Woodwork. Curtis Woodwork embraces both the usual structural units and the cleverest contrivances built in or permanent furniture, such as bookcases, dressers, buffets, and cupboards. Every model is conceived and created with the purest art, ripest scholarship, and mellowest craftsmanship which can energetic enterprise can command. It made to conform rigidly to the architecture of each particular type of home, the cost considering the quality is amazingly low, and a trademark on the individual piece prevents any substitution by careless contractors. Source Lovecraft Studies, Volume 7, Number 1, H.P. Lovecraft, S.T. Joshi. Alright. Uh, ooh. What just happened? That was weird. It just, like, flipped around on me. Gotta be something to look at over there. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Lovecraft on tobacco and alcohol. Lovecraft hated tobacco, even though he used to smoke when he was 12 in order to look and feel like an adult. In his correspondence with friend Reinhardt Kleiner, he claims that he quit as soon as he started wearing long pants. He also had a very strong opinion about alcohol, as evidenced by his letter to Zelia Brown dated 13 February 1928. As for the matter of drinking, I have never tasted intoxicating liquors and never intend to. Having a strong aesthetic disgust at anything which blunts or coarsens the delicate natural equipoise of the evolved human intellect and imagination. Drinking excited my personal pugnance, hence I don't drink. Let the herd do what they will. I'm rather in favor of prohibition. The prohibition of any one antisocial force as well as of any other. Source, The Spirit of Revision, Lovecraft's Letter to Zillia Brown, Reed Bishop, H.P. Lovecraft, Sean Brainy, and Andrew Lehman, St. Joshi. Like that's everything. Often, I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm, a mere freak of fever, as I lay sunstricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down into their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. All right. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. That's not good. It shall not find me. Oops. God, that hand. The window, the window. Hey, there we go.
And that is Dagon. Um, I don't, honestly, I don't remember if I've read that one in the past or not. I've read a bunch of Lovecraft stuff, but it was many, many years ago, so it kind of slipped my memory. Either way, that was pretty good. It was very well voice acted. Um, the images were pretty good. The scenery was solid. There was interesting stuff to look at while you're listening to the narrator basically just read you a story. Uh, and that's, it was just interactive. I, I don't really want to say interactive story is barely interactive. It was really just, hey, we're going to tell you a story and show you some pretty pictures. Um, but it's a free to play game, very well voice acted. I, they picked a good story to do this with. They're definitely uh, much longer stories that I don't think I'd have the patience to sit through for this kind of format. I think I'd rather just read them myself. But I think this could be a very good introduction for people to Lovecraft. Um, maybe someone sees this and they're like, okay, let me you know pick up uh, one of his books or look into him a little bit more. At this point, everybody's heard of Lovecraft, but I don't know how many people have actually read him. So overall, fine for what it was. I give it a thumbs up. I enjoyed it, and it's definitely something I would I would recommend. And again, it's it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. Just sit back, relax for half an hour, and listen to a story. I think it has VR support too, which actually could be kind of interesting. I, I might check that out just to see what it looks like looking around with that. So that's it for this week. If you enjoyed this video, we look at a new cheap game every week on Steam. I also play a lot of Wild Rift. I'm playing Lost in Random right now. I uh, just finished playing Imposter Factory, and there's a lot of other games and all sorts of other stuff I play. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, please hit those like and subscribe buttons. That's it for now. I am Monkey Chaos, and I will catch you next time. Later.